today we're talking about sewing machines for junk journals and specifically what to watch out for before you buy. A couple of years ago I went and got one so I bought this little beauty and I absolutely love it. I use it for so many different things. I add borders on tags, I've done fast flow stitching on the cover of a junk journal and of course I've sewn around lots of pockets. I call it a game changer but what do we really need to know before we buy one? Two years on from buying this there are definitely some things that I know now that I wish I'd known before. Sewing on paper is quite different from sewing on fabric and that means that the functionality and the features of a sewing machine are a little bit different too. So today I'm going to share what I've learned by answering three key questions. What is a must-have? What don't we need a machine to do and therefore we don't need to pay for? And would I buy that one again? I also have some insight to share on what several other large YouTubers use when they sew on paper in their journals. So subscribe if this all sounds good to you, if you sew on paper, and let's have a look at my machine and see what we need. As usual on my channel I have a page of tips which will be in Pinterest and you can also take a screenshot. All I do is create a single page for each of my weekly videos and put them in Pinterest so that they can help you have a go at a project and not have to write things down. With this video today, I'm sure that whatever machine you use, you might know a lot more than me and you may also disagree with the points that I make about stitches and what we need, what we don't need and what to buy. I'd love it if you could put your points in the comments down below. Share what you know and let's all learn. And to answer those three questions, starting with what is a must-have, I thought I'd illustrate my views by using my Hob Hobbycraft MIDI, which I showed you before. This I've had for two or three years. It originally cost me £40. I looked on the website yesterday and they're currently listed as 45, having got about a £10 um, amount off. But I would say that although many of you I know are not in the UK, Hobbycraft is a UK company, this can be found in a similar guise on Amazon. So I have found quite a few machines with not necessarily a dial here, some of them have got electronic buttons, but the number of stitches, the capability, the, the style, the format, the size, the weight, it all is just the same. It just doesn't have Hobbycraft on it, but it does exactly the same. So if you have a look on Amazon, you might be able to find something very, very similar to this if this is what you're interested in. So the first must-have that I want to point out and talk about is your stitches. And this is where I think the needs as a junk journaler are perhaps just a little bit different from what you might want if you sew on fabric and, and, and as I say please do comment down below. So the stitches that I think are really necessary are a running stitch, we've got some here, just go a bit closer, so we have a running stitch and a zigzag and there are a few others on here but I think for sewing on paper I really use the running stitch and the zigzag and not much more. This has buttonholes and some others and I, I personally, I don't use those for sewing on paper and neither do I sew on fabric. So you want not only running stitch and zigzag but you want them in a couple of sizes and you can see that we've got some different sizes here, we've got quite a range. And specifically, what you want is to be able to vary the width, see how these here are wider, and also the length, so the number of stitches that you get in an inch or a couple of centimetres. And on this machine, the change to the stitches is incredibly easy too. So all I do is turn this dial here. It's got a lovely, lovely feel. I like the click, you know when it's in place to the next position and I can very very easily just turn this and know that it's been done, know that it's gone to whatever the number is that's on this little illustration over here. In terms of details of stitches, 
I think you want certainly stitches that are not too small. I'm not sure I've ever used this really teeny tiny one here. You want stitches maybe this size and this size because if you go too small I find that if you're sewing around a pocket or sewing around a tag, particularly if you've only got a couple of layers of paper to sew, then you might end up tearing the paper. So definitely go for a machine that has got a range of stitch sizes so that you can choose what you want for the project that you're working on. I use zigzag a lot and in terms of this particular machine I tend to use number two, setting number two for my running stitch and setting number four for my zigzag. If I'm doing a snippet and I've made snippets with lots of little bits of paper I might go for a five or a six going down that and the reason for that is these are wider stitches so it kind of moves through the paper a bit faster and makes your snippet come, come to fruition a, a lot more speedily. The other must-have is reverse and on this machine I have it down here so you can see I just press that down so on this machine in order to go into reverse I have to maintain the pressure on this little lever it's not, you can hear it pinging there, it's not too difficult to push down. There we go, we just go all the way down there and then you let go when you want to. So you want running stitch, zigzag and reverse in terms of stitches. And for me that's the basic stitches, that's all, pretty much all I would want. I'd use reverse at the start or end of a piece of work of a project. So. I might be sewing round a journal card, so I'd do forward and backwards to begin with, or sewing round a tag, a bit of forward and backwards to give it some robustness and strength. So reverse is obviously absolutely necessary. And the other feature that I think I want to point out, I'll show you around here, is the speeds. So the speeds on this particular machine are low and high the off button is just in the middle so it's tucked around the end of it easy to get at I'll be honest most of my projects because they are making ephemera I personally work on the low speed and that works pretty fine for me but as I say if you're making maybe a long snippet or you're going down the long side of a large pouch I made one of those a while ago you might want to go on the high speed alternatively you might just be a highly competent sewer unlike me and want that to high speed but I think at the very least you want to be able to go from a low speed to high and you obviously want to be able to get at that button really easily. Another must have and I'm sure this comes with every machine is your tension adjuster. So the tension adjuster on this machine is just on the top here and I've probably found this to be the most difficult thing to get right and as a beginner, I think that's, that's probably entirely reasonable. And any tips you have about setting tension, please, please put those in the comments box down below. So I vary it according to the amount of paper, the thickness of paper I have. And literally, it's a dial. So you can see, you can see a number. And I'm learning what goes, what number is needed for which collection of papers, what sort of thickness of paper. So it's easy to get at. And I think that's what's important. And it, it's got quite a wide range. So this goes all the way to, I think it's about 9 or 10. And then you can play and you can bring it back. So I have played with that and I needed to because I wasn't getting it right when I started using this machine. I've also learned that varying the thread, which obviously goes on the top here. I've got a nice brown one in. The thread thickness seems to make a difference too. Let me talk about what I feel is the most important feature for me when choosing a machine. And again, this might not be what matters to you because your machine might be in a static position. But this, just easily lift it with one hand and you can see the size of it. If I put my hand on the front of it, you can get a sense of how big it is. So I'm challenged for space. I think we all are these days. So this little beauty doesn't take up much space. And because it is just under two kilograms, I looked it up, I think it's 1.96, I find it really easy to move around. So when I, when I make something, I lift it from on 
the little chest of drawers that's on the right hand side of me and I put it down on my desk and I find that really easy to do and because it's easy it means I use it more often so if something's accessible as a tool or maybe as one of our craft supplies don't you find you use it more if it's something that's easy to to get into use and to play with so size and weight for me is important but because I want it to be on my desk, I will need it to be maybe where I'm filming, I obviously also need the lead lengths to be good. So something to think about is the length of lead that goes to power your machine. So is that going to be long enough from where you want to sit it? And this one is about a metre and a half. So you can see the quantity of, of cord there. And another aspect I think I will mention at this point in time, there's the foot, is having a foot that works for you. So this is very lightweight and it's, you get used to it but it's a little bit binary. So it's a little bit stop-go and I think if you had one of the more upmarket machines the foot would give you a bit more of an analogue result so you'd be able to vary your speed. I've watched a few other YouTubers and I've heard the machine speeding up. This one is a bit more stop and go. The, the foot is also, because it's light, possibly a bit more easy to sort of move around on the floor as you're putting your foot on it. So those are a few considerations too. Overall, what I think a beginner would need, this is just my opinion, is simplicity so that you're not put off for playing with this and using it and that means having a bobbin filler that's also easy and you can see this one is just in here easy to get in and out so I would just it's got its thread on pull that in and out and it's very easy to thread up and talking of simplicity and help another feature worth thinking about is whether the machine that you buy has got supportive videos. This one does. If I don't know how to do something and it took me several times to watch it when I first got it, like threading the bobbin on top, then you can watch a video and they're just short ones, they're straight to the point and it will tell you what to do. Under here, in terms of threading the needle, there is a light and I think that's also a must have and a consideration. So do ask to see whether there is a light in a reasonable place and how strong is it? Is it, is it good enough as a light for you? And overall, this is, I think it's a fantastic machine. Those are the must-haves. What does that mean in terms of the things that we don't need and don't need to pay for? So what I don't use is a few of these stitches. I did have a go at making an interesting master board with strips of paper and I think I used some of these more interesting stitches on that but to be frank they don't really show up that well on paper so I'm not sure that I, I would even need a machine that had those. I don't think therefore that you need some of those machines that have 57 Heinz variety of choices here. Personally I don't need to pay for one that has this and this all as a an electronic keypad. I actually like ye old fashioned, turn the dial and just know what you're getting. This machine doesn't have some kind of free arm extension over here. I wonder whether your machine has one of those. Obviously it's a very, let's say a low cost affordable option. This doesn't have one. So a big arm out here is possibly, around here, is possibly one that you would want if you're sewing on fabric and have large pieces of fabric to deal with and I'm not sure I'm going to need that with paper but maybe with your paper projects you do let me know in a comment down below and overall I just don't need complexity I want a simple life I want something easy that isn't daunting and this one allows me to just play at making so many things so I had a chat with a few friends here on YouTube and they also told me what they use and I thought it might be useful to just share and in fact see what we can learn from what other sewing machines some of these great 
YouTubers actually have and put to good use in making their ephemera and their junk journals. So in no particular order, and I do have some pictures that I'll try to insert, let me share what I learned. So we've talked about my Hobbycraft MIDI. Tracy Fox, a great sewer of paper here on YouTube, has a brother in of IS55, and I hope that I've got that right. But she also told me a few other things. So she says that she has a spare in the loft for when it gets serviced, so that's a great idea if you can have one. And she thinks it's an Italian machine. She also has a vintage Singer, but it's never used. So a little collection there going on. Speaking of collections, let me talk about Andrea Allen. So Artie Mays, I think I counted seven or eight that she confessed to having. She has a vintage singer. She has three Jamomis, if I'm saying that right, including a quilting machine, a singer midi, a brother in of ISV3 for embroidery and a few more. Some are in the loft and some are at her sister's. Andrea, you've got a lot of sewing machines. Louise has a Bonina 1010 and she sent me a lovely picture of that. That came from her grandmother, as did Helen's, which is a Toyota, and they looked really robust. It, they look like they will go on forever. Barbara has a Toyota, and Tina has a brother FS40, which she told me came from Argos, which is a shop here in the UK. Joanna Clough, down in Australia, who does a lot of sewing, makes beautiful journals, has a Singer sewing machine, and just lastly, but absolutely not least, let me tell you what Gail said. So Gail has a Singer patchwork, which she says is not their most expensive model, but is a great workhorse. She confessed to rarely cleaning it. I hope you don't mind me saying that, Gail. Uh, but it just keeps going. And before this, she had a Singer from 1975, which she still has, and it still works, although it's resting these days. My conclusion is that we don't all have the most expensive, most new machines, but boy, oh boy, do we make some lovely things with them. So would I buy this machine again? I think my answer has to be a yes. And the reason for that is, despite getting more confident in using a sewing machine, just from practicing sewing on those pockets. I find the size and the weight of this one to be just absolutely perfect. I pick it up and I put it down on my desk, I move it around really easily. It's also not too big and overall it's super reliable. And for those reasons for me this one works but what works for each of us might be a little bit different. I hope this video helps you choose a sewing machine, maybe decide to keep your sewing machine, or how exciting, go and get one. And if you've enjoyed this video, then do subscribe and give it a thumbs up because that really helps. And I hope to see you soon.